social media is is ruining word of mouth. That that companies have said, well, instead of doing something distinctly different in our organization that creates word of mouth, we'll just try to get people talking about us using Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And they've they've sort of ceded the word of mouth um, control to social networks as opposed to actually doing something different. Welcome to the Schweiki Media Expert webinar series where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello everyone, I'm here today again with Jay Baer and Jay has spent 23 years in digital marketing and customer experience, consulting for more than 700 companies during that period, including 32 of the Fortune 500. His current firm, Convince and Convert, provides digital marketing advice and online customer service advice and counsel to some of the world's most important brands such as the United Nations, Allstate, Cisco, and Cabela's. Jay's Convince and Convert blog was named number one, were, uh, the number one content marketing blog in the world by Content Marketing Institute and is visited by more than 250,000 marketers each month. Jay also hosts and produces the Social Pros podcast, which is downloaded 65,000 times monthly and was named 2015's best marketing podcast by the Content Marketing Awards. And today we are here to talk about Jay's new book. Talk Triggers, Strategic Operational Differences That Create Word of Mouth. Jay, how are you doing today? David, I'm fantastic. Thank you for that warm introduction. I think this is the first podcast that I've done talking about the new book. The new oh. book isn't, isn't even actually written yet, much, much less out. So you get uh, credit for, for being the first. Thank you. Matt. <laughs> all right. All right. I don't know how many uh, firsts I've had in my life, so I will That's take the first it. First one. Yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. Awesome. Well, first off, let's just uh, give us a brief overview. Uh, yeah, I know you've had a ton of success with your past books, Hug Your Haters, which I enjoyed so much. I referred it to multiple people who needed uh, help in this area because it was just – Fantastic book. I, I love the way you write. It's so actionable, and uh, a lot of times you get books, and there's all this theory and all this stuff, but uh, you do your research, and it shows. And then also your other book, Utility, I know was you know on the bestseller, you know, number one bestseller on Amazon and number three on New York Times. So I assume the same amount of effort and results will come from this one. So give us a brief overview here. Every company in the world has a choice. And the choice is to do things the same as everybody else in the industry or to do things different. And when you make a choice to be different, what it creates is word of mouth. And when you do word of mouth well, it gets you new customers for free because your current customers tell other people, tell their friends, who then become future customers. Now, if I just ask everybody listening right now to raise their hand, uh, one hand on the wheel up in the car, raise your hand. Just do it right now. Raise your hand if you care about word of mouth in your business. Every single person's hand just went up Mind because up. everybody cares about word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, keep your hand up if you have an actual strategy for creating word of mouth. Yep. Almost everybody's hand just went down. Yep. The research shows that approximately 1% of all businesses have a defined word of mouth plan. Yet, we all know that word of mouth is important. However, we just treat it like it's going to have, like, oh, yeah, sure, that will just occur naturally. But, but will it? The problem is we don't give people anything to talk about. David, do you know what never happens? Nobody ever says, hey, uh, check this out. Let me tell you about a perfectly adequate experience I just had. <laughs> Right? Nobody says that. Being the same is lame. We ignore things that are similar, and we talk about things that are different. So the book Talk Triggers is all about how to do things different in your business to create word of mouth and get new customers at no cost. Wonderful. But wh why now, though? You know, word of mouth is – it's so not – I mean, it is not new, right? I mean, nope. I remember going back when I was selling ads in college 25 years ago, and you know, the number one objection you'd always get is we do word of mouth. We do word of mouth. So it's probably one of the most oldest forms of marketing, you know, and you're actually making it into an actual, you know, real marketing thing. But what instigated that right right now? You know, you know what what got you going on all these studies and then, and then actually publishing a book about it? Did something specific catch your attention that you know brought this, you know, really drove this home for you that you needed to feature this? Yeah, as you know, I've done a lot of work in social media as a consultant and as an author, 
And my conclusion is that social media is is ruining word of mouth. That that companies have said, well, instead of doing something distinctly different in our organization that creates word of mouth, we'll just try to get people talking about us using Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And they they sort of seeded the word of mouth um, control to social networks as opposed to actually doing something different. Hmm. And. And the thing about word of mouth and sort of the thesis of the book is that word of mouth isn't really a marketing strategy. Word of mouth is an operations strategy. So as we define it in the book, a talk trigger is an operational differentiator that creates word of mouth. So let me give you an example. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of hotel chains in the United States. Only one has a talk trigger. And it's Doubletree Hotels, because every single time you go to a Doubletree, they give you a warm cookie. They've been doing it for 30 years. Everybody knows it. Everybody talks about it. If you do a search on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram for Doubletree plus cookie, you would be shocked at how much content there is about that one simple differentiator. Hmm. Now, every other hotel could do something like that, but none of them do. That is interesting. Uh, I, I know, you know, even before, I, I know this is just what you're all about in general. As far as you don't just write what you know, this is what Jay thinks. Um, of course, you add your you know years of experience to apply to the data that you collect. And again, that's why I really enjoy following you and listening to you because it's it's always backed by substance. And you, you mean you, know, you mean not to. Um, Banner, do you too much? But you have a lot of style as well. But you really do have a ton of substance behind uh, everything that you talk about, everything you write about. And again, that's that's you know one of the main reasons I love following you. But uh, so to, on that note, can you provide some data points that um, that are around you know the importance of the talk triggers? Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Thank you. First of all, it, as a as a consumer of business books, it sort of bothers me how many business books there are out there where where the author just says, "Hey, this is what you should do," with, mm-hmm. with no evidence at all. Yeah, no proof, no evidence. Just like I think you should do this, so you should go do this. And I guess it's good that those books are written, but I feel like there has to be more to that. So when I go to write a book, uh, I typically do first person research, which we're finishing up right now. We we go through all the academic research and there's a lot of academic research on on word of mouth. Then we interview 50 or 60 companies. We interview a few dozen experts. And so I think it's because my original career was journalism. I take that I take that viewpoint of business books. It's not just like, let me tell you as a consultant what you should do. It's let me find a trend, document that trend, not just from my perspective, but from the perspective of the research and other experts, and then present that trend to you in the pages of the book for your consideration. That's kind of how I think about it. So word of mouth is so much more powerful than than we think or at least as we then we typically accept 90% of all considered purchases are influenced by word of mouth and 20% of all purchases are directly caused by word of mouth so think about that it's 20% of business on average but yet nobody has a strategy for it it's crazy it is crazy there's nothing else in business that that is that important that nobody actually pays any attention to they just say oh yeah word of mouth is going to happen uh they, it just it's a very laissez faire approach to it so that's the part that really struck me as so amazing we started doing the research is like wow this is so incredibly important to the success of almost any business yet everybody just sort of assumes it's going to be there every day like the sun coming up uh, it's so, really fascinating. That is so fa- awesome that you because circle back again to the hug your haters book. You're talking about customer service, right? <laughs> it's customer yeah. service, right? That's just customer service. But you're like, no, 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 no. Customer service is much more than that, you know. So you, now you've you you put you flip customer service on its head. Now you're flipping this <laughs> word of mouth on its head, and it's fascinating. I cannot re- wait to read this book. And now I did, uh, you know, go through you know the um, the notes of the book that you had sent me before the podcast, yeah. and and I did what I love what you said here. Uh, about if businesses in their marketing are to survive and thrive, they must become the thing that people are talking about rather than interrupting people in places where they've gathered. Now, I know that this um, 
if it's if that sentence alone is something people can understand, that's somewhat surprising. But I know that just the whole like really understanding and getting that is still not completely picked up, at least based on yeah. the majority of marketing that you see out there. Now, some yeah. people do yeah. do it, right? But it's just something that I think needs to be talked out a bit here. So can you speak on that a bit and, and, and yeah. do your very best to put it in terms that people can really finally understand? So in, in Hug Your Haters, we said that customer service is the new marketing, and it is at some level. In Talk Triggers, what we say is that operations is the new marketing, because if you do something different, people will talk about it. You don't have to do anything else other than be different. They will talk about you, and when they talk about you, it gets you new customers, as opposed to what we do today, 95% of the time, is we run a business that is 2% different than our competition, and the way we try to get customers is by interrupting potential customers and saying, hey, you should buy stuff from us. Yeah. So if you just do something different, you don't have to do as much marketing. You certainly don't have to do as much interruption marketing. Look at uh, the, the coolest cooler. It's a ice chest. You put drinks in it, et cetera. It was a Kickstarter program. Uh, you know, everybody's seen a lot of ice chests. Yeti's a real popular brand now. There's lots of different Coleman. Uh, there's tons of different ice chests. Well, the thing about coolest is they said, well, if we're going to make an ice chest, let's make one with a talk trigger. And this ice chest, this cooler has a blender built in a wireless battery operated blender built into the top of the cooler so you can make drinks. It also has a cutting board. It has knives. It has a Bluetooth speaker. It has a light system. It's a party in a cooler. They put it on Kickstarter, tried to raise $50,000. They raised $11 million. Wow. That's the power of doing something different. Now, anybody could do that, but nobody chooses to do that. Another example. Did you know, David, that the Cheesecake Factory – Cheesecake Factory restaurant. I'm sure most people are familiar with that brand. The Cheesecake Factory spends five times less, 500% less on advertising than any other restaurant chain in their competitive set, the sort of luxury casual uh, set. So their competition is Olive Garden, et cetera, 500% less. And the reason they do that is that they have talk triggers. They have three talk triggers. Talk triggers at Cheesecake Factory are these. Number one, they have an enormous menu. They make all the foods. Whatever you want to eat, they make. I had my intern permanently borrow a menu from Cheesecake Factory, uh, and I had her count the words, 5,940 words on the Cheesecake Factory menu, which will be more words than are the transcript of this podcast. It's crazy. Yeah. Second talk trigger. Portion size. You get a steak sandwich at Cheesecake Factory. It's the size of a baby, right? Nobody ever finishes their food at Cheesecake Factory. You always take food home. It's a talk trigger. You always tell your friends. I can't believe how big this bowl of pasta was. Third talk trigger. It's in the name, the number of kinds of cheesecake they make. They have right now 33 different kinds of cheesecake. Listeners, if you grabbed a piece of paper right now and I said, guys, uh, name me all the kinds of cheesecake that you can think of off the top of your head, nobody who is listening right now can name more than nine. You get to nine and you're like, I'm, I'm out of ideas. They have 33. They're making cheesecake out of dirt, salmon, motor oil. Doesn't even matter. <laughs> like they'll make any, any substance. They'll make a shark cheesecake. They don't care. So that's a talk trigger as well. Now, this is part of their business. It's decisions that they made, right? This isn't a marketing approach. It isn't a campaign. It isn't an ad. It isn't a Facebook post. It's them. It is their operations. And when you have the courage to do something truly different in your operations, to a large degree, the marketing takes care of itself. Interesting. Yeah, and I think we, you know, as far as, and I'm assuming, obviously, you know, Cheesecake Factory obviously does less marketing, but they do some marketing. But that's a, that's a topic Very for another discussion. Like, yeah. Very but but that but, but there's there's ways to spread the word and you know get it out and you know and yeah. all of that. And and that's yeah, we talked about in the book sort of the, ampli the amplification of 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 word about the amplification of your talk triggers. One of the chapters in the book, it's it's set up very. Um, very particularly because there's a lot of good word, word of mouth books on the market. Uh, most of them are a few years old now, but there's a lot of good books out there. But one of the challenges is they don't really give you a system. So Talk Triggers has what we call the four, five, six system, Perfect. which is the four things that must be true for something to be a Talk Trigger, right? The four right. criteria that must be So now, be we're, now we're getting into – so you've convinced us, like, hey, everybody, stop. 
your your life can become so much easier. Your business goals can can be achieved so much easier if you think this through before you implement it all. So now I think you convince everybody how important this is. And I'm sure people are thinking like, yeah, I knew that was important, but you, you forgot, or you, maybe you never knew, or you know, or you, maybe or you're you always thought, or or you always thought it was important, but you just didn't have an actual strategy to make it happen. You just exactly. assumed that it would happen. Exactly. So now we're gonna now you're gonna walk us through and I'd love to spend some time here and let's yeah, walk everybody through your four, five, six structure yeah. of the talk trigger system because there's one thing again, you know, people who say this is what you need to do but you know, we're not giving anybody action items to, to, to accomplish again is what separates people like you and some other uh Yeah, I'm not gonna write a book there. like that. Exactly. So yeah that. I'm not gonna write a book that you can't put into practice because exactly. I'm not gonna waste my time and you shouldn't waste your time reading a book like that, frankly. It, exactly. So let's Go for it. To walk us through this, Jay. So the four five six system is there's four things that must be true for something to be a talk trigger, and I'll talk about a couple of them in a minute. The the five is the five different types of talk triggers. And six is the six step process you use to create a talk trigger in your own organization, four five six. Okay. So things that must be true. Uh, the one that I will I want to talk about most particularly, because it's the one that people uh, are the most, it, it just causes more conversation discussion, is that a talk trigger must be consistent, or as we talk about it in the book, it must be repeatable, which means that to be a talk trigger, an operational differentiator needs to be offered to all customers. It has to be something that is always true. If you go to Cheesecake Factory and you order a steak sandwich, all the steak sandwiches are that size. It's not like some customers get a big steak sandwich and everybody else gets a regular size steak sandwich. It's not like they only have big steak sandwiches on Saturday or on Christmas or on at brunch, right? It's always the thing. This is a challenge because we are at a place right now in marketing in particular, David, where there's lots of interest and emphasis in surprise and delight and shock and awe. Let's take a customer or a circumstance or a scenario and let's do something disproportionately interesting, wild, wacky, noteworthy in that particular scenario, circumstance, or for that one customer. And when we do that, we hope that that creates a chatter effect, that that creates a word of mouth opportunity. And sometimes it does. You see this for hotels. There's some kid and they bring a kid a teddy bear or whatever and it's great and everybody's like, oh, and it you know, gets kind of some clicks on Facebook, but that's not a talk trigger. That's 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 a campaign. That That is a publicity stunt. It doesn't make it irrelevant. It doesn't make it something you should never consider, but it, it's not going to propel your brand over the long haul because you're only doing it every once in a while. And I will tell you that when you treat customers inconsistently, you run a real risk of those customers starting to resent the brand because they start to say, well, how come that kid got a teddy bear but my kid didn't get a teddy bear? I'll tell you, the best way to, to think about this, David, is uh, think about how airlines, at least in the U.S., handle boarding now. Southwest is a different story, right? They've always been kind of egalitarian in that way. But all the other airlines have actually added boarding groups this year, added new ones. Like American has, I don't know, like 37 different boarding groups, right? I mean, it's insane. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I understand why they do that because they want frequent flyers like me to get on first and that makes them feel better. Okay, I get it. But if you're in boarding group infinity and you're getting on the on the plane like with dirty diapers and ice bags and like live cattle, you are not feeling very great about that experience, right? You are literally creating contempt in your customer base by treating them inconsistently. So the one thing that you've got to remember about talk triggers is that it needs to be something that everybody has access to, not only special customers, not only on Saturdays, not on leap years, every time. Gotcha. Now, when we talk about different ways to create a talk trigger, as I mentioned, there's five different styles of, uh, of talk triggers. One of the ways to do it is with uh, usefulness. And I'll give you an example. There is a guy in New York City, his name is Jay Sofer. And Jay is a locksmith, noble profession, been around a long time. There's lots of locksmiths in Manhattan, like tons, right? I mean, there's a lot of doors. He is not only the best rated locksmith in New York on Yelp. He is the best rated business in New York on Yelp of any kind. Think about that. Think about the, the competition be the best rated business in all of New York. It's insane, right? Yeah. Here's why, that, here's why that's true. Anytime he comes to, to do your locks, 
Uh, it doesn't matter if it's nights or weekends, emergency service, he always charges the same. So again, a consistent talk trigger. He never upcharges you based on circumstance. It's never extra because it's Saturday, extra because it's two in the morning. It's always the same rate, number one. Number two, his real talk trigger is that when he works with you, he's got to let you in or change your locks or whatever you need. When he's finished, he for free goes around your entire domicile and does a security audit of your windows and door locks, and then oils every single lock, not just the lock that he worked on, but every single lock in your home, your apartment, et cetera. It's such a talk trigger. If you, look, if, you look in his, if you look in his Yelp reviews, my favorite one, and the one that I use on stage and in the book, is from a lady who says, I almost want to get locked out again. That's how <laughs> the service was. Now, what about his pricing? Yeah. Is he priced competitively, or does he yeah. upcharge, or does it, not, yeah. does it, does yeah. it even matter? Doesn't, I don't think it really matters because most people don't know what the lock, you know, but if you said, what does the locksmith cost? Most people are like, I don't know, a yeah. hundred bucks. No, but it's not something that people really know the price of unless they've done it recently. He but could yeah, probably he charge a little bit more. That, he you probably know, could. That, that but he takes the extra 20, 30 minutes to do all those yeah. extra things. Yeah. But he does it, you know, and doesn't have to do any advertising or marketing because anybody who's used him tells him, you know, tells their friends about him. And so then they kind of jot his name down or bookmark his web page, et cetera. And then if they ever need him, like, oh, yeah, that guy, Jay, that's the guy we got to call. All right. That's awesome. So so we're looking at in, in our keep up here with the uh, four, five, six. Are, are we, we're on the four R's of the talk trigger, no, is that correct? Uh, no, I've talked, about, uh, uh, I've talked about the four R's, talked about one of the key ones being repeatable. And then of the five uh, types of talk triggers, one of them is, is being useful, which is certainly what you Gotcha. Have. Yep. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Keep on giving us your wisdom, buddy. This is good stuff. One of the things that's really critical, and I think one of the most important parts of the book is, is the six, the six-step process for how to create talk triggers in your own organization. And it ain't easy, right? If it was easy, everybody already have one because you really have to meaningfully say, all right, look, we are as an organization going to commit to doing something different enough that customers not only notice it, but they tell their friends about it. Right? And, that, and you can't just like wave your magic wand and have that yeah. happen. You got to really think about it, right? But it's not an accident, right? It really is a strategy for how to do this. And so in the book, we walk through the six steps, which include uh, listening to your customers, talking to your team, coming up with some candidate talk triggers, testing them, measuring the re results, et cetera. But there's a, a great example of a restaurant that I talked to recently for the book. It's called Skip's Kitchen. And Skip's Kitchen is in Sacramento. Skip used to be the regional manager for a whole bunch of Chili's restaurants. So he knows everything about, about the restaurant business and, and worked in Chili's management program for 16, 18 years, something like that, long time. And then he decided to go out on his own and said, okay, I'm just a guy trying to run a restaurant, and I'm competing against these corporate behemoths now who I know very well, I I'm going to have to do something different to stand out. Because, yeah, you can have good food, and you have to have good food, but is it possible that your food is so much better that that becomes your word of mouth? Like, it's pretty tough, right? Unless you're going super, super high dining, you know, Michelin star, going to blow you away, molecular gastronomy, something like that. He said it's really almost impossible to drive business with food quality, especially as a sole proprietor. It's just, you know, unless you have a, a star chef, it's almost impossible. He said, so we got to come up with something different. So here was his talk trigger. When you go to Skip's Kitchen, and you order, it's counter service, no waitresses. You, you, you order and they bring you your food. You order at the counter. Regardless of how many people are with you, it's just you, it's you and seven people, whatever. Somebody in your party gets to, gets to play the game. They pull a deck of cards out from underneath the counter. They fan the cards out face down and you pick a card. And if you pick a joker, your entire meal is free. Oh, wow. He gives That's away awesome. he gives away on average about four free meals a day. It costs him several thousands of dollars a month in in zeroed out uh, you know uh, charges. But it's the only marketing he does. He said he's never spent a single penny on marketing since the day opened, not one cent ever. Huh. 
because every single person who wins is taking selfies and telling their friends, and you won't believe what happened to me, and it is his talk trigger. And he did it on purpose because he knew he couldn't compete any other way. I mean that that is awesome, and and all the every example you've given it, it, are, are you know are awesome. But you know I'm sitting here hearing all this, and you know I'm putting my I always try to put myself, you know, in you know thousands of business people's shoes, right, and owners' shoes, and I, I can see like what you were saying about the food quality. Now you know that guy obviously knew his stuff from being in the industry forever, yeah. and you know, but logically it would have been you would have thought that yeah, let's give the best food and let's give the best service and you know a lot of those are basically almost platitudes right now in, in a lot of ways so i fear that people are going to have a, a tough time and i'm maybe you know i'm sure your research has shown this or maybe maybe it hasn't i don't know but you know with breaking out of that mindset yeah. you know of the yeah. of the platitudes like how i I, I know you're not going to have an answer. I mean, how can you give me an answer that's going to be for the hundreds of thousands of businesses around the world, right? Like, I mean, you I mean you have to sit down and you got to think through. But is there anything that you can do to help people with that exercise? Yeah, is there absolutely? I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Um, Sally Hogshead, who's a fantastic author speaker, um, said this best, and I interviewed her for the book, and she talked about it in her own book, Fascinate. And it's just this: different is better than better. It is very. It is almost impossible to create conversation if your value proposition is that you are somewhat better than the other guy. The way you create conversation is by being different than the other guy. Gotcha. So to say we're going to be incrementally better at food and incrementally better at customer service, yeah, that you know you should probably do that anyway. Exactly. But it's not going to create word of mouth. It's not a talk trigger. Gotcha. So if you are consulting with somebody, you know, you go into a company, you're going to sit down and you're, you know, I, I would almost see this, hey, let's do an exercise. Let's everybody write down everything that you think we're awesome at. That makes us great. And then you just go down that list and everything yeah, and, that somebody 90, else could 90, say. 90% of them will be customer service. Exactly. Which is complete BS because they're yeah. not. Um, yeah. And so you throw all those away. Actually, yeah. the better way to do it, David, is to actually ask customers to say, okay, let's look at all the social media chatter. Let's look at all the emails, all the phone calls, everything that customers have told us. And then you analyze that and see if there's individual patterns in the data that, that will reveal a talk trigger to you. That's the best way to do it. Not gotcha. Do it, but, but you sort to say what are customers talking about today that they find noteworthy and then you sort of ratify that internally but sometimes you got to start from scratch and say okay what 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 could we do differently today that that we haven't done in the past and and what would that require for us to do operationally i just learned about a new example three days ago i was in prague uh at an event in the tourism industry, and I was talking about this concept, and one of the attendees in my session said, oh, we have a talk trigger. We just developed it. I said, oh, tell me about it. She runs the convention center in Antwerp, Belgium. It's called the Flanders Convention Center. It just opened uh, a year ago, almost exactly to the day a year ago. They decided to build the convention center inside the zoo. Hmm. So their slogan is a room with a zoo, <laughs> which That's, is pretty fantastic. God, right? I love so, hearing so. I, as a marketer, I just like I love hearing. It's clever. great, right? So you know, yeah. think about how many how many convention centers are there? Thousands, right? There's only one in the middle of a zoo. So you're like doing your presentation. There's like a giraffe walking by, right? That's a talk trigger. You're going to tell everybody. Hey, I went to this conference, and there are giraffes there. Uh, in addition to PowerPoint, it was remarkable. Uh, it's so smart, right? I mean, it's like. Of course, it's, it's such a great idea. So that's going to be a talk trigger uh, case study, and, and that's going to be in the category of talk triggers that are overly generous, which is one of the other five ways to do a talk trigger, generosity, because you get free admission to a zoo during your event. Uh, I love that idea. That is phenomenal. That is awesome. Yeah, no, I, I think – yeah, I think you're. Yeah, I really think we're getting somewhere here, and, and you know, I'm I'm getting some clarity um, as well because I, I still also had the, you know, I, I mean, I, I get it. You know, I get that. Stay away from the platitudes. I get that. You know, something that everybody could say, but yeah. I, you know, I was like, well, how do we get there? How do you get there? Yeah, how do you get there. Let me give you another example. So uh, I was at this event in Prague, and somebody asked a question. They said, well, what's the difference? 
and I want to make sure I get this part in the book too. They said, what's the difference between a talk trigger and a USP, a unique selling proposition, very common uh, marketing concept? And I said, well, a USP is something that is going to focus on features and benefits. It's going to be articulated with bullet points, and it's something that you communicate about in a boardroom. A talk trigger, a talk trigger is something that's probably not about features and benefits as much. A talk trigger is not articulated in, in bullet points. It's a story, and it's a story that you tell while you're drinking a beer. It's not a story that you tell in the boardroom. Am I hearing this right that almost it almost feels like if you had to choose, you got your marketing department, you got your sales department, and you got your customer service department. It almost feels like, hey, customer service department, you take this on. You figure this out. I mean, again, I know this is going to be a collaborative effort, but yes. am I hearing that right? I mean, it almost feels um, like, like that's almost where it could come from. It's definitely a collaborative effort. We talked about that in the book that it really you need you need all parts of the organization to participate because everybody's got to got to be a part of it, right? If it's sure, a relational sure. difference, everybody's got to be on board with that. Um, the natural inclination is to have marketing team be in charge of it, but here's the problem with that. And I don't. Uh, it's not like you can't do it that way, but here's the challenge. Marketing thinks in terms of bullet points and campaigns, right? They don't think in terms of core operational difference. Mm -hmm. Marketing is in charge of telling people about your differences as opposed to just being different and letting them figure that out for themselves. So sometimes mm -hmm. marketers have a hard time understanding talk triggers because it feels like they're not doing as much work as they should. So they're like, well, you're telling me that we don't have to create a whole campaign about this? I'm like, no, if you show up and there's a zoo there, what campaign do you need, right? There's, it, it's its own marketing, right? It, it will create- well, you just follow up or you fun. follow up on the social yeah. interactions, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that's it, right? It's not that hard, right? And so sometimes when you, when you have a good talk trigger, like Cheesecake Factory, you don't have to do a lot of marketing. And sometimes the marketers are like, well, wait a second, what am I supposed to do now? So that it gets a little bit weird. Customer service, I think absolutely could, could, could be a big part of it, partially because customer service actually knows what customers really want. If you're thinking about what talk trigger could we build in our organization, you have to include sales and you have to include customer service because marketing doesn't know what customers want. It's one of the great fallacies in business. Marketers have no idea what customers want. They think they do because they've got a persona on their desk or they've got some sort of report from Google Analytics, but marketers never talk to customers. Marketers aren't interacting with customers. They're not on the phone with customers. They're not dealing with customers' problems every day. That's not what marketing does anymore, not in the modern age. It was 25 years ago when I started this business, but it's not now. So if you're going to try and create any sort of customer-focused you know, experience in your organization, marketing should never lead it by themselves because they're talking to them. They're talking to themselves. They're in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the worst place to understand customers is in a conference room. You've yeah. got to actually talk to customers and marketing is usually not really about that. Not anymore. No, I know. Yeah, no, I'm hearing you. And, and of course I, I didn't, you know, you don't have to choose between customer service marketing and sales. I was just saying if you had to, you know, you only had one to go at it and you had, yeah. you know, you know, almost sounds like, but of course it's going to be collaborated, but I hear what you're saying on that. And I can see where marketers would miss the mark, you know, especially for like a manufacturing type of company, you know, like, yeah. well, you know, how could we really, I mean, you got to get, get in there and say, okay, if we follow this, particular product up with something, you know, I, I don't know, you know, like Birchbox obviously guys, did a fantastic guys, right. job of Both it, you know, yeah. yeah, based on just their product itself. Now, right. but to, 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 to move into the follow-up on the marketing, because you can get this, you know, this many, you know, you know, fire going, and if you want to fan the flames to make it a forest fire, I'm sure you can facilitate that with some marketing help, and I think you mentioned that a little bit ago that yeah. you do have a section in the book now how to follow up on that. Can you can you touch on so all the marketers out there uh, don't feel um, completely worthless <laughs> uh, yeah. like myself? Uh, you know, where do they come in to? You know, you, you have an amazing owner and you have an amazing operations person and great customer service, and everybody work together and like boom, we have this big thing. It's the cookie, right? Yeah. Um, now where 
do you see them playing a part to help you know make yeah, it's that funny into? You say that. It's funny you mentioned the cookie per se. They just launched DoubleTree just launched their first big uh, national advertising campaign where they're actually talking about the cookie, right? They're actually okay. you know making it the star and sort of connecting those dots for people again and and refreshing it and those kind of things. So so certainly if you have a good talk trigger, you don't need to do a ton of of campaigns around it, but it certainly helps to amplify it, right? To make sure that people know that that is a differentiator. I'll give you a good example that we talk about in the book. Uh, you probably know Krispy Kreme. Mm -hmm. Krispy Kreme makes amazing donuts and they make them fresh all the time. Well, when they are brand new off the assembly line, every Krispy Kreme store has a big red neon sign outside that says hot and fresh. Oh, yeah. And when that sign is on, and it's giant red neon sign, when the sign is on, people who are driving by know that the donuts are hot and fresh right now, right? That is their amplification mechanism. They do it through signage, right? But, you know, they don't just... They don't just assume that you'll know when donuts are hot and fresh. They tell you with their sign, right? So things like that, you, you want to try and bake into your talk triggers process uh, so that customers have some sense of, of what's actually happening and why you're different. I see what you did there, Jay, with, with baking baking it in <laughs> with the Krispy yeah, Kreme donut. There you go. Now, now, of course, you could also create you know campaigns around that, and you could even do mm -hmm. geotargeting with just simply the hot and fresh sign you know, the blinking light and some little interactive or moving. Great for mobile, you know, graphics. with mobile marketing would be amazing. Exactly. You know, boom, just your boom, phone. boom, boom. Yeah, you could do uh, with your app, with a, a Krispy Kreme app, you could do a push notification, uh, you know, in a geo. All that stuff. Geo fence. But uh, it's all centered yeah. around the talk trigger. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, no, I, I got you. And, uh, you, you know, I, I obviously you haven't come out with the book just yet, so I haven't read it yet. But I do know, like, in Hug Your Head, well, you I've talk about it. I haven't written it yet. So oh, yeah, written it. <laughs> yeah, well, good. Uh, I'm glad I haven't missed it there. Um, the, Writing starts tomorrow. Writing starts tomorrow. All right. Well, we're going to be looking out for it. Now, I, I guess so. I assume you're going to be talking about, you know, listening and amplification. I do know in, in Hug Your Haters, you talk all about, you know, listening and how to find all that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's another follow up you obviously can do and then just facilitate and get involved in those conversations. And you can do all kinds of stuff. It's all about scale, right? Like, how big are you? You know, you can even get yeah. influencers involved to do all this stuff. It's but from the research but, that we did, we actually did some social listening. Um, with the Conversation Research Institute on some of the talk triggers in the book, like um, the cookie and things like that, to, to demonstrate how much social chatter there already is mm -hmm. about these differentiators. It's pretty interesting stuff. And then you just go in and engage, right? And then just get it going more and more and more and more. And then if you get engaged on these posts and these Twitter feeds, I'm not sure Twitter works this way, but I do know Facebook works this way. If you know somebody's talking to you and you get involved in a conversation, that naturally feeds up the organic you know, news feeds with Facebook. Yeah. And that's one yeah. thing that we're trying to educate, you know, our clients on and uh, is trying to develop, you know, get these conversations going and talk about the importance of it because that's what Facebook is actually, I've really grown to absolutely love. And I've always been a person who's, you know, like uh, big corporations and the government and I've always been leery and da, 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 da. But, you know, Facebook's one of the biggest companies, but they mm -hmm. really have – uh, done it the right way in the sense that they try to – they've really put their focus on the product and the marketplace and what people want and everything. So when people – conversations are happening in their algorithm you know, with these engagements and stuff, it triggers to them um, that people want – to be seeing this conversation, right? So, you know, when you get, but the, the the key and the hardest part is, is getting them going, getting those conversations going. That That's the big, and I think that's a big thing that, you know, you, you've kind yeah, of touched on here of, and there. Most of, most of the things aren't worthy of conversation, right? No one's and that's the whole point time. of this. No one's going to spend their time having a conversation about something that is A, the same, and mm -hmm. be not worthy because it's not a good story, right? Mm -hmm. we, we keep expecting our customers to tell stories about things that are not worthy of a story. Yeah. Like that's the fallacy right now with social media and all of marketing. It's like, well, how come our customers aren't talking about us? Because you've done nothing worthy of conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and same goes with content marketing. You know, the story, uh, all of it is, is just like, I, I mean, I will say execution is difficult for, for certain people and certain companies. You know, it is difficult to get everything going and, you know, knowing how to utilize Facebook correctly and making sure your designs and all that stuff look good and email. But I, I will say that's all tactical and it can be figured out. Now, you know, again, you know, bandwidth sometimes, you know, limits people from being able to do that. 
But I, I will say, you know, like our company, we have all that figured out, but we still, each and every individual case that we work with, I will always say the hardest part is developing the story. The hardest part is finding something that people are going to really love to hear about and talk about. And, and I've seen like that's becoming – it's circled back around – to this is here we are again. All the automations ran their course, and everybody caught up, and everyone's doing it, and lots of people are learning how to do this and that. And it's circled back around to the story. It's it's like how how important it is because that's going to make everything work better, and that's why you're doing this. So well, especially when I'm get I'm totally when, seeing the timing the of this where, now. Yeah, I mean we're we're I mean think about this when when we are in the very near future where everybody has artificial intelligence driven digital marketing where where machine learning and and AI takes over and and your robot assistant is figuring out your email and is figuring out your Facebook ad and is figuring out your website copy and everybody's playing with that kind of level of automation and and artificial intelligence which is going to happen then if everybody has equally sophisticated tools, then the only way you survive yep. is by being more strategic or having a better story. Yep. That's it. That's the yep. list. Yeah. Unless you to compete on price, which is a road to ruin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you just took it to the next level. You know, I you know, I was talking about, you know, humans catching up and understanding and learning how to do that. I mean, of course, you know, the automation wasn't necessarily human, but learning yeah, how to work. It's going to happen. Then, it's it's going to happen. And now it's going to, yeah. you know, then it's just like, it's going to be really easy for everybody to do all those things. And it's going to come back to the talk trigger, the story. The yeah, because right now factors. you can still, right now you can, especially in digital, right? You can still win by being better at the tactics, mm -hmm. by understanding Facebook better, by understanding content yep. better, by understanding email better, by having a more dynamic, interesting, personalized website. Like you can still win with tactics. Mm -hmm. Eventually you can't win with tactics because everybody's tactical execution capabilities will be so good that it'll be very, very difficult to be disproportionately better than your competition, at which point it really does become about strategy and story. Gotcha. Table stakes keep rising, don't they? Yes, that <laughs> the is true. table customer keeps getting higher. Customer expectations are liquid, that is for sure. Gotcha. Well, um, man, this has been fun. Uh, before I let you go, uh, let me just see, what, what are the most common mistakes that you see people make here? It, what can you tell somebody like, whoa, we keep, we've seen this two. happen over and over. Yeah, don't do this. I think it's two. I think it's one, uh, believing that word of mouth is important, but doing nothing to ensure that it happens. Okay. And two, thinking that being a little bit better at something makes you worthy of conversation. You know, having good customer service, having uh, a good price, being kind to your customers. Like that's that's table stakes. No one's gonna no one's gonna talk about that uh, with a beer in their hand and say, yeah, the food's pretty good there. Like that's not gonna work. That that doesn't yeah. that doesn't create customers. Yeah. And what's amazing about this, David, is that when you take off your business hat and you take off your marketer hat and you just live as a customer, as a consumer, which we all are, every single thing I said you know to be true. Because you don't talk about average experiences. Nobody listening talks about average experiences. Yet as soon as we're in a conference room, we assume that our customers will, tall, will talk about average experiences. Mm -hmm. And they won't. Yeah. And, and, and definitely this is not an R&D thing. This is not a research and development thing. This is simply sitting down and saying, what can we do? And it could be a cookie. <laughs> we get in there. Yeah, it doesn't have right? to be anything. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. In fact, it, it really shouldn't be anything massively robust. One of the uh, one of the four R's is realistic. That the talk trigger has to be realistic. It can't be so grandiose that people start to question the viability of it or your intentions. Mm -hmm. When when the talk trigger is too big, like okay, you're gonna win a car or whatever people start to distrust the whole thing, right? It actually creates suspicion. So it needs to be big enough to be noteworthy, but small enough to be believable. And there's a kind of a sweet spot there in the middle that, that people have to kind of fit into that, that window. Yeah. 
Well, you got me thinking. This has Good. been awesome. Yeah, I, 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 again, you know, same thing happened when we, we had the podcast about the Hug Your Haters. Is I was like, all right. I mean, I read the book. and Well, maybe I didn't have it coming into the podcast. But before I read the book, I remember thinking to myself, what am I going to learn here, right? But I was curious. <laughs> I really was. I was like, customer service, okay. Same thing here. You know, I, I was like, all right, you know, it's word of mouth. Let's. Let, what is he going to say today, right? And uh, now you got me hooked again, once again, Jay. Thank awesome you. Well, my, stuff. I, I feel like my role is to to take the common out of common sense. <laughs> well, you definitely, you definitely. I, I see it, I, and I'm curious to see what the next thing you're gonna you're 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 gonna take. You know, an everyday Maybe HR. Thing. It might be HR and employee relations. That's what I'm thinking about, but I don't know. We'll see. That see, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. Well, Jay, how can people continue to learn from you? jbear.com, uh, B-A-E-R. That's the place for all the info. Then our main site is convinceandconvert.com, as mentioned in the intro. Lots of podcasts, ebooks, webinars, multiple blog posts every week, tons of research, uh, lots and lots, hundreds of thousands of marketers visit every month. We'd love for you to be there too, convinceandconvert.com. Awesome. All right, Jay. Until next time. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Keep you posted. Thank you.